name is Leonard Walpery. I work for CIMIF, the International Maize and Weed Improvement Center here in, uh, in Mexico City. Um, I'm also the chair of the Agriculture and Rural Development Working Group of the Scaling Community of Practice. So here we have the Scaling Community of Practice and the Big Data Community of Practice joining forces uh, today. And uh, this organization or this community of practice is really passionate about learning about scaling. Um, I'm very happy to introduce this fourth um, webinar in the series of big data and scaling and also the last one. We kicked off six months ago with a session or a webinar on the what and the why of scaling. Uh, also all with the eye of the, the big data and scaling. Then we had a session on the science of scaling last month on the art of scaling. And today we talk about the, the practice of scaling. All the recordings can be downloaded on the Big Data website. And since last week, we also have a, a community of practice, scaling community of practice uh, website where you can also download them. So I think a few people will disagree that it's important to reach impact at scale, right? And we generally do this with a public good imperative. After all, most of our money comes from taxpayers, right? But what, the, the, what does that mean for the relationship between public and the private sector? And what is the role of data in this? That's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm very happy and honored to be sharing this moderation today with Daniel. Daniel, introduce yourself, man. <laughs> uh, thanks, Leonard. You know, like we kind of mixed feelings here because with this webinar, we, you know, this, this webinar series on this topic of scaling is, is coming to its end. But I'm very happy and pleased to, to see you all attending and once again. So I'm Daniel Jimenez. I'm the leader of the community practice on, on data driven agronomy. And, you know, I, I, we'd be very happy to work, as, as Leonard said, like joining forces with the Agriculture and Rural Development um, uh, Group on, on scaling with Leonard. And um, just to, uh, to, to, to remind to all, to all of us that this community um, of practice um, on, on, on data to agronomy is part of the CGIR platform for big data in agriculture which basically works to harness the capabilities of big data to solve agricultural problems, as we said, in a faster, better, and at greater scale. And, and we also say that this is, you know, our kind of our slogan is, is feeding the world um, bite to bite. And, and one of the main, goal, main goals of this community of practice is to, to, to keep moving forward topics uh, um, on, on related to, to data-driven agronomy, to facilitate, communicate, collective action on in this year we, we we have chosen this topic on, on on scaling as the last year in our convention in india uh, when we were talking about digital extension uh, we 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 ca we kind of got to the con to the consensus that it was important you know for digital extension uh, to to understand much better uh, what scaling was about so today we're bringing virtually a couple of colleagues uh, virtually uh, they will share with us the, their experiences on scaling in different geographies. So let's get started and I hand over to Leonard who will introduce our first speaker. Yes, thank you. So I'm really honored and, and very happy that we, we managed to get Didi Nueneli. Uh, she's the managing partner of Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited, which works across West Africa, shaping agricultural policy, creating catalytic ventures and implementing ecosystem solutions. She's also the co-founder of AICE Foods, which sources from over 10,000 farmers and produces a range of packaged products for local and international markets. You've probably seen her face if, you, if you're familiar with the TED Talks. So we are very happy to have her. Nididi, we invite you to share your screen and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Leonard, and congratulations for your focus and the success of your webinars over the last few weeks and months on scaling. And thank you for being such a champion for the scaling process. Um, I think we've interfaced on a few platforms and this is a great one as well. Um, I have a quick presentation, which I'll give in over 10 minutes. And then I'm sure at the end of all the presentations we'll engage in questions. And I wanted to focus on my experience uh, driving private sector-led interventions and scaling on, in the African context. But to start, um, I always use this picture when I present because what got me into this sector is the fact that when I moved to the United States at 16, this was the face of Africa, a hungry child. Everywhere when people would remind me that their parents told them to finish their dinner because they are starving children in Africa. And this picture was very perplexing to me because I was born and raised in Nigeria and 
I didn't see this type of hunger. Um, Nigeria and the rest of Africa is naturally endowed for agricultural excellence. Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be feeding ourselves and the rest of the world. So I've set up a number of companies and run some day to day. One is called Sahel Consulting and we work across Africa, transforming the agriculture and nutrition landscape of our region. And we engage in a number of projects with many, many partners. I'm sure many of you are familiar with quite a few of the organizations represented here, really focused on ecosystem solutions, really focused on transformation, on driving change on private sector led growth. One of our interventions, which I want to talk about, is called Advancing Local Dairy Development in Nigeria Intervention. And this actually came out of a strategic project we did with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as they were trying to think about what to do in the area of nutrition um, in 2015, 2016. And we came up with an idea to basically transform the dairy sector in Nigeria. Nigeria is a large country. We have 200 million people, the fourth largest day cattle herd in Africa, and yet we import 95% of the processed milk we consume in this country. We have a high rate of malnutrition and milk is expensive for the average family. So the idea with uh, the Advancing Local Dairy Development Project is to transform the dairy landscape by enabling private companies to backward integrate. We started with a pilot program between 19, uh, 2017 and 2019 called the Nigeria Dairy Development Project. And now we've scaled it up to from two states to five states, from two processors to six processors that are committed to sourcing locally. Um, and what we've learned and what we've learned from this scaling process is that first of all, you have to get the government involved from the get-go. Shaping policy, ensuring and enabling environment for local sourcing is critical because if imported milk is cheaper and it's subsidized from the Netherlands, from Denmark, from New Zealand, there's no way African farmers can compete. So from a policy perspective, an enabling environment perspective, that's critical. In addition, with productivity improvement, with farm organizations, with infrastructure development, you need the private sector partner committed and engaged because ultimately when the donor funding is exhausted and when the project is done, you need to ensure that this project continues and that the, the private company continues to source locally because it makes business sense, because the right thing to do, and because it's environmentally sustainable. And then there has to be a gender lens with every scaling initiative to ensure that women are empowered. And in our case, women own the milk, men own the cows. And so financial inclusion and training and engagement of uh, female dairy uh, farmers is very, very critical. And then finally, the nutritional component, because it's one thing for these families to sell their milk. It's another thing for them to be disadvantaged because they're now selling their milk instead of consuming it. So how do you ensure dietary diversity? How do you ensure that their lives become better while the life of the rest of the ecosystem becomes better? So there's a, very co a lot of complexity with scaling. And because we're doing this in multiple sites with multiple players and multiple governments, um, it's definitely a challenging project. And we can see that some of the results we expect to achieve at the end of five years in terms of numbers might not seem very large to you, but this is a catalytic project. So over 200,000 beneficiaries directly, but imagine 75 solar powered boreholes and the whole process of, of providing water to communities across the country. Um, ensuring that we create a feed and fodder industry where one didn't exist so that these cows don't have to travel to get um, their feed. Um, inseminating cows, more like a demonstration to ensure that this continues even after we're gone. And then creating a whole vet infrastructure where one didn't exist. Um, so this is an ongoing project. We've learned a lot from the pilot and now with the implementation, we're even learning more. So stay tuned. The second hat I wear is that I'm the co-founder of a food company, which is 11 years old, called Ace Foods. And we started Ace Foods because of the challenges we noticed. 40 to 60% of our fruits and vegetables go to waste. Um, Nigeria is a net importer of food, and yet we have the best spices, the best uh, seasonings, the best grains in the world. So we wanted to basically displace imports, source locally, and address the high rates of malnutrition and prove that we could be a catalytic business. Um, and through this work, uh, and Ace Foods is thriving today, we currently 
and major cities across Nigeria, we also export. But through this work, I've noticed critical barriers to scaling, which I think is important to address um, from the private sector perspective. Obviously, access to catalytic and patient financing continues to be a barrier. Um, linkages to markets, linkages to information, talent. Talent has been the biggest barrier faced to scaling. When I mean talent, I mean qualified and capable em employees who are passionate, who are skilled, and who understand how to work in our environment. Data, access to data, access to credible data to inform data-driven policymaking, but also to inform private sector decision-making is critical. And we've talked about the policy environment. And so I spent the last year writing a book called Food Entrepreneurs in Africa, Scaling Resilient Agriculture Businesses, because I wanted to scale. I wanted to learn from those who are scaling. And the first chapter in my book really focuses on what some critical realities are, what some promising trends are. And this is applicable not just to Africa, but across the world. When you think about the critical realities that we face when we're trying to scale, climate change is a critical reality malnutrition and eating habits and food habits, infrastructure, talent and financing gaps I've talked about, gender inequity I've alluded to, and then trade and regional and local trade dynamics. But then there are many promising trends and digitization is one of them. And through Aldine, the Atlanta Local Dairy Department, we're leveraging digital technology. If each of our extension workers has a cell phone, we're uploading data into our data portal, we're collecting primary research, we're doing using a digital technology to communicate with our farmers, but also we've embedded chips into our cows. So all through in interventions, we're leveraging digital technology and the ability for us to leapfrog leveraging digital technology is immense. They also the promise of young people, 70% of our population is under 35, getting youth engaged is critical, the growing middle class, the growing interest in healthy diets and then the focus on equity. So we launched a business in the whole process of COVID called nourishingafrica.com and Nourishing Africa, attempts to close these gaps and address these scaling issues. Our vision is to help 1 million agribusinesses in Africa scale to unlock this $1 trillion industry. Um, oh, sorry, $3 trillion industry. And what we're doing through Nourishing Africa is providing access to data, access to funding, access to talent, access to training and access to capacity and celebrating African food. Right now we have 600 agribusinesses already actively using this portal. And I encourage you to check it out if you haven't. And then through the book, again, I, I uh, came up with a model which I want to leave with you. If we want agribusinesses to really scale and to leverage the challenge, to embrace the challenges and address them, there are six critical components. The first is our interventions have to be demand-driven with measurable value addition. Now, many of our interventions are development partner-driven and government-enabled uh, or driven, but not private sector driven, not demand driven by the consumers who need it and who are willing to pay for it. Our interventions have to leverage data, they have to leverage technology and innovative financing. They have to shape the ecosystem from the beginning. You as an entrepreneur cannot wait for the ecosystem to shape you, you have to actively shape it. And COVID-19 has reinforced that. We have to have efficient, effective systems and structures. Now, this is one that I did not include in my first book and learned will notice the importance of telling your story, of building your brand, of packaging yourself, of amplifying your voice and being very strategic with every intervention in how you do that. And then finally, embedding resilience into your DNA. No intervention can scale if it cannot respond to shocks, if it cannot mitigate shocks, it can, if it cannot pivot, if it's not agile. And if anything 2020 has taught us is the importance of embedding resilience into our DNA and being prepared for future shocks linked to climate change, but linked to future pandemics. Now, these are critical for scaling resilient agribusinesses and technology, digitization, but also agility is really, really critical. So as I, as I wrap up, I want you to consider some critical steps and the key learnings for me from all this work as an entrepreneur, but also from interviewing 80 entrepreneurs who have scaled. The first is we have to build stronger partnerships. And that's why whenever Leonard calls me, I jump because I think it's really important to engage with others. And what I've realized in our food and agriculture ecosystem is that we have often work in silos, but we have to partner with those in financing, in health, in nutrition, in gender, in climate change, in manufacturing, in technology, to really partner, to shape our ecosystem, to unlock the potential, but also to close the barriers. We have to put private sector at the heart of our design. Through our research, it has to be private sector driven. SMEs, 
are the heart of innovation and growth. And we have to design for, with them in mind. Every research institution should have a private sector advisory board. If this is not happening, we need to make sure it happens. So we're investing in demand-driven research, but also commercializing that research and testing it out. We have to invest in talent for the sector. And this has been the biggest, biggest barrier that I've seen. And finally, we have to partner across the board. I think food and agriculture is the heart of SDGs. And unless we can scale business in this, in this sector, we will not be able to achieve the SDGs. And I'll leave you with this picture. I started with a very sad picture of African children. Um, and now this is the picture that I want you to think about when you think about Africa. These are vibrant, healthy children who live full and meaningful lives because they can achieve their highest potential, because they practice nutritious food. And the current quote and my current mantra is from a Tibetan quote, which says, if I tell you my dream, you might forget it. If I act on my dream, perhaps you'll remember it. But if I involve you, it becomes your dream too. And my conviction is that I'm involving everybody I can in changing the narrative around Africa, in changing the narrative around scaling, and in changing the narrative around our collective responsibilities to ensure that we provide affordable food, available and make it available for the most vulnerable people. And that's how we can create the future that's brighter for this young generation. I look forward to working with you all to scale our businesses, but also to partner to solve some of our collective challenges as we ensure a more equitable and inclusive world. Thank you so much. And finally, we have our 10th anniversary coming up soon, uh, the 24th of November, and I'm inviting all of you. It's gonna be a great event, so please, Sign up and I hope you'll join us. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ndidi. I mean, it was a very inspirational presentation. You know, I, I was taking some notes and I probably, during the wrap up, you know, I, I probably uh, talk about some of the things that you have mentioned and how important it is, you know, all the things that you just mentioned in order to, to scale in a responsible way. So now we, I'll introduce our next speaker, my colleague uh, Ram Dulipala. Uh, he leads the digital agriculture team at Decreasat, another CGIR center. That's why I call him my colleague. You know, we work for the same organization. Uh, from ICRISAT, he's been uh, doing an um, exemplary uh, work building and executing a partnership-based approach with the private sector towards a digital agriculture. So over to you, Ram. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, let me just get my screen up there. And if you can confirm that you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it very well. All right, great. Thank you for this opportunity. I think that was a great presentation uh, from NDD. I think uh, you will see that uh, there are there will be a lot of similarities in uh, what I will also try and present. But very quickly, this is the title of my talk, Scaling Impact in a Digital World. Uh, it's a story about uh, Icrisat Sci-Hub, which was uh, started in the year uh, 2016. Um, and as my title goes, I am the theme leader for digital agriculture and youth at Icrisat. So very quickly, uh, let me just go to my next slide. Okay, just give me a moment. Okay, yeah. So this is, uh, you know, just to speak about the mandate of the digital agriculture and youth theme at ICRISAT, you know, we have, uh, my research program has dual facets. Uh, we have an internal facet wherein, you know, we are looked up uh, by all our internal research units like our crop improvement teams or agronomy teams. We are kind of the digital people for them. We help them, you know, some of our internal units use digital technologies uh, to, you know, unlock efficiency gains in research and in extension, et cetera, et cetera, or add new capabilities to ICRISAT as an organization. The more exciting facet of the research team that I lead is more the external facing facet, wherein we as a neutral research organization, we look out there in the world and we see how is it that digital uh, as is actually interacting with the space of agriculture and what is the kind of research that we can do. But why is upscaling, uh, you know, or why is scaling up very, very important to us? Uh, I have a bullet right at the bottom of my slide. One of the uh, mandates of the research team is we are looked at as the people who can upscale proven tools and technologies through digital means and technologies. Now, I, I need not tell most of the audience that today it is a well-accepted fact that uh, 
you know, digital technologies, digital tools are all pervasive, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. So the question to the agriculture research and development community at large is how do you piggyback on this digital revolution and then deliver on the agriculture uh, development and transformation goals that we have, right? So essentially, when we were able to articulate all these, uh, you know, the, the mandate of the digital agriculture and youth theme way back in 2016, we figured out that there are four pillars uh, that were essential for us to execute on this grand vision of the digital agriculture and youth theme. You know, the four pillars are one is partnerships with private sector tech companies and development actors is very, very essential if we were to realize on our, you know, on our mandate. Strategic engagement and an ecosystem approach is another pillar that we figured out was essential. Business incubation and acceleration is uh, another pillar and then technical and scientific backstopping. So we figured out way back in 2016 that, okay, if this is the mandate that we want to achieve, these are probably the four pillars uh, that we really need to, you know, incorporate into the functioning of the digital agriculture and youth theme. So what did we do? Uh, we figured out that, you know, we have to give an inst we need to take an institutional approach to, you know, to crystallizing and executing on those four pillars. So we essentially repurposed this whole idea of an incubator. Now, the idea of business incubators has been in work for, for quite some time, I think since late 1960s. But, you know, we also figured out that somewhere incubators traditionally have become these peripheral units within research organizations. And we always look at these units as some kind of units which are meant for upscaling of proven research technologies. That is where we kind of slightly pivoted on the idea. We, we decided that in ICRISAT, if we want to digital, do digital agriculture, we will do it in a slightly different way. So what did we do? We took this incubator, we kind of molded that incubator a little bit, and we converted that into an instrument of research and bilateral grant execution, right? So what are some of the principal activities that we do undertake uh, you know, in IHUB? We do a lot of business incubation. That is, we support a lot of digital agriculture startups. We are very consciously, we do a lot of partnership development. We also do what is called as ecosystem development, which I'll explain to you a little later, but we also do a lot of acceleration and upscaling, right? Now, these are the activities that we do for some of the startup partners that kind of approach us and who want to partner with us. Now, why should a startup come to Icrisat? What is it that we offer? What is our value proposition? The value proposition we offer uh, to these partners is we try to you know access give some of these startups access into some of the ICRISAT operations. We do broker a lot of facilitations, a lot of linkages between scientists and startups. See, imagine like most of the digital agriculture startups, you know, come are founded by, you know, technologies, whereas scientists are traditionally being rooted in a very different world. So we believe that there is a fair bit of brokering and moderation that's kind of required when you do and enable some of these linkages. We also do mentoring and a lot of support from some of the bilateral projects, right? Again, a lot of brainstorming and a few sessions later, we figured out that, you know, if we, if this is the mandate of IHUB, if this is the goal we want to achieve, right? We really need, uh, you know, the kind of staffing that we needed, the kind of people that really need, who kind of uh, need to be placed in this kind of an IHUB, we figured out that, you know, you need a lot of hybridized roles as we would like to call it. Uh, hybridized roles is, mind you, not my word. It's from a very famous paper from Ed Skovitz written in 2002, where he actually uh, kind of came up with this idea of a triple helix model of innovation, where he kind of said that incubators should become melting points, melting pots of academia, state and industry. And essentially in some ways in IHUB also, that's kind of the way we try to model it. Uh, and the kind of staff members that uh, we have as part of my team are essentially, I'd like to you know categorize them more as entrepreneurial academics or academic industrialists or entrepreneurs, stuff like that. So that's a bit about introduction of IHUB, what we did in the year 2016. Uh, this is kind of the portfolio of uh, companies that we've been incubating, accelerating, supporting over the course of last four years. Uh, we had some fantastic successes as well. What I will do is I will also present to you a quick case study about uh, this startup called Pete uh, and also about this startup called Kalgudi. Two startups which I think have really you know, uh, attained scale thanks to the partnership with iHub and thanks to some of the interventions uh, that uh, we've been able to deliver to them. Okay, um, And also, you know, it's been a very interesting journey uh, through iHub. It's not as if, you know, iHub has only been about, you know, helping others scale up. 
uh, but we've also forged some very interesting partnerships. We've also co-created a lot of digital tools and technologies uh, through partnerships with startups as well. For instance, one particular tool called Measure, which is a digital MND platform that we basically partnered with one of our iHub startups. Uh, this is a fantastic MND platform, uh, which today is being used by about six CG centers. Now, when you think of scaling up, let's not just think about scaling up in terms of, you know, uh, you know, platforms or interventions going out there to farmers, right? For instance, uh, the measure platform today is, is has nearly 500,000 records supporting a lot of MND activity all across different CGR centers as well. So that's a kind of a slightly more internal uh, inward looking example of scaling up as well, right? Yeah, again, a quick uh, snapshot of uh, when I say eco, uh, this is a quick, uh, you know, for instance, impact at scale, uh, as I said about the startup called Plantix, uh, they are downloaded by about 12 million plus farmers. Uh, you know, officially in 2019, I think Android quoted that it is the largest download uh, downloaded agriculture app on Android Play Store, right? So we basically helped Plantix go from 5,000 downloads in the year 2016, all the way till probably where they are today. Similarly, Kalgudi is another startup where, you know, they had about 25,000 farmers before they got incubated with us. Today, they are, you know, about 2.5 million plus. So I'll quickly give a snapshot of the case studies. Uh, but when I say about ecosystem development, etc., there is a lot of, you know, enabling work me and my team do. For instance, you know, this is my colleague, Dr. Srikanth Rupavataram. I'd like to, you know, call him as an academic entrepreneur because he's a PhD, he's an agriculture scientist. But as part of my team, he works very closely with the Plantix team, does a lot of scientific technical backstopping them. He also builds a lot of their network, a lot of their, you know, uh, policy advocacy pieces as well. So here he's demonstrating the Plantix app to the Prime Minister of India. Similarly, this is a picture from 2017 when the DG of ICRISAT, uh, Dr. David Bergwinson, he was presenting about the idea of iHub and this whole notion of, you know, iHub as an innovation broker to Mr. Bill Gates and to the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh. Apart from that, you know, I and my team, we involve in a lot of policy advocacy as well. So like, for instance, I am the co-track lead of the agriculture track uh, in the ICT40 conference. These are a couple, couple of very, um, you know, popular pieces that I've written in some prestigious magazine around the need for digitalization. So me, me and my team, collectively as a whole, we spend a lot of time in this notion of ecosystem development as well. So quickly, let me just move on to the case studies in the interest of time. So this is about Plantix, as I was telling. So we started our association with Plantix in the year October 2016. Um, and as you can see, uh, the collaboration has been fantastic. And as I just told you, this is my colleague, Dr. Srikanth, who basically was almost like, you know, working for Plantix. He was part of ICRISAT but he was spending a lot of time on supporting Plantix. So here he is speaking to a popular uh, news channel in India. He's explaining about Plantix and its uniqueness. And here he's kind of conducting these large scale workshops on you know, how to use Plantix amongst the extension workers. And here again, you know, we, we, we basically, you know, we did a lot of farmer workshop. We did a lot of networking on behalf of Plantix because somewhere along the line, we got to understand that uh, a, a soft, uh, asset of CGIR is the fantastic partnerships that we have. And somewhere, apart from the hard science of CGR network, the soft science of CGR centers also can be put to good use when you really want to upscale some high quality interventions. That's exactly what we did here. Here, you know, we reached out to the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh at that point in time in 2017 and got him to officially kind of launch the Plantix app amongst the extension officers. Net net, a consequence of all these activities, you know, from 5,000 downloads in November 2016, the app today is downloaded by about 12 million people as of October 2020. Uh, and also, you know, it's not just about advocacy of this particular app. A critical uh, feature of the Plantix app is the huge image uh, images that are needed for training the deep neural networks in the background. Thanks to Ecrisite's partnerships and thanks to our technical backstopping, we were able to, you know, uh, engage our partners and collect nearly 26 million plant image data sets that are essentially going in into you know the plantix data set and actually training the deep neural network you see a small split of the downloads 
obviously i think it's 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 fair to interpret that 74% of the 12 million downloads are from india which is essentially a direct consequence of the very active work uh, and the support that ecrisat is extending to you know to plantix as of today there are about 800000 active users every month the the app is able to identify you know diseases across 35 uh, vegetables fruits cereals and legume crops over 500 pest diseases and nutrient diseases also can be identified by the app so that's a bit about the plantix one case study as to how uh, you know through our approach through you know our role as an innovation broker we were able to you know take an innovation and really you know blow it out there uh, apart from you know blowing it out there are also you know couple of uh, joint outputs that plantix and icris had together collaborated and developed for instance last year when uh, fall army worm was getting very big in india we jointly launched this you know uh, fall army worm dashboard Uh, to support the policy makers in government of india and various state governments similarly for andhra pradesh government we also you know provided uh, this kind of a dashboard wherein on real time basis governments could understand you know the spatial and temporal spread of various diseases across different crops so these are some joint outputs that we were able to demonstrate uh, moving on this is another startup called kalgudi which i kind of said you know they were having about 2500 users in april 2017 uh, they've actually upscaled to close to 3.5 uh, million users as of november 2020 right thanks to our support again so basically ecrisat's intervention in this particular case was ecrisat was undertaking an agriculture transformation project for government of andhra pradesh again right so there uh, what we did was we strategically embedded this particular tool uh, in such a way that you know the the net effect of uh, this particular platform kalgudi became viral of sorts and over a course of two and a half years they basically upscaled from 2500 users to close to 3.5 million users right uh, some very interesting outputs even this particular uh, platform has been able to develop is you know it's probably in my next slide for instance uh, ecrisat is done and we moved on for the project but i think kalgudi has got so well embedded and so well institutionalized uh, in the you know in the self help group a moment within the state of andhra pradesh that today they run these kind of e-commerce stores wherein close to 10000 self help groups if i get my number right but you know the uh, about 14500 rural you know products from uh, you know over 10000 self help groups are cataloged and are presented on this kind of an e-commerce store so all of you are also free to go to the store actually order stuff from this now if any of you had been to the big data convention in the year uh, 2019 Uh, we basically had a small physical outlet of the kalgudi store where there was a woman entrepreneur representing one self help group and she was actually selling all the stuff that were listed on this particular e-commerce store again these are quick snapshots as to you know this is an actual physical demo plot that ecrisat was doing but what we did through bringing in kalgudi is we basically complemented the physical extension with the digital extension of this kalgudi right in the process we added value to ecrisat's own contribution but you know we also supported a, a a startup attain a certain scale and now i think the startup has more or less become self sustaining because of the uh, intervention that we did uh, finally uh, i don't know about my time permits but because i think one of the questions that we wanted to answer uh, is about how do you use data to scale up i think daniel did mention about this particular question now this is some data that uh, you know i we collected from our measure dashboard as i kind of told you in a few slides back measure is an mnd tool uh, that my team co-created with a startup that we had on this incubation platform called ihub uh, once we started digitizing all the mnd data that is the wealth of data that's available only within the cgir centers and once we started getting the creative juices of our startups flowing these are some of the kinds of dashboards that some of the startups were creating for instance this is a very interesting dashboard which kind so was, was able to you know inform back ecrisat as to how variety spillover is kind of happening across india and different east african east and southern african countries thanks to digitizing all the data and thanks to applying a layer of business analytics and some data science on it and with the creativity of a private sector startup we were able to you know uncover these kinds of insights or for instance uh, this this particular dashboard wherein ecrisat was you know able to know how each of its different mandate crops you know which all countries are they you know contributing to and what are the traits they are active across what i'm trying to get to using these slides is once you are able to you know use data in a very smart way it kind of gives you a lot of insight which is lying out there but you probably won't realize for instance this kind of a dashboard can really help 
ecrisat management prioritize and you know strategize much better so that was my last case study i wanted to present about you know um, uh, you know how do you use data to basically scale finally this is my summary uh, this is our i probably i think necessary to ingredients of scale this is based on my own reflection and my own experience of working with startups and you know my own experience of observing these startups okay uh, i think scaling is a multi actor multi dimensional activity uh, it is very very essential to build teams with very diverse skill sets you know i i recollect one of my calculus teachers in engineering used to tell me this he said knowing something about everything than everything about something i mean you know no individual or no team or no organization is going to know everything or have all the skill sets right so you need to build diverse skill diverse teams uh, who can work together uh, soft skills are equal if not more important than hard skills uh, you know mind you uh, i can't underline uh, this statement enough then uh, you also need some argware innovation as well i think ndd mentioned about you know the importance of private sector advisory boards within research institutions i i completely agree in fact say that uh, probably cgr institutions new new units or departments like ihub that can actually essentially house these hybridized roles that i just mentioned about you know people have an understanding of science but need not exactly you know work like a scientist they're probably a little more entrepreneurial but ha just have enough of an orientation towards science so that you don't essentially you know end up selling something like a snake oil um because not everyone is comfortable straddling across different disciplines and worlds third i think a systems view is very very essential uh product innovations i think you see this is a problem i come from a i'm a i was a technocrat for a long period in time i come from a techy background i very often see a lot of startups uh, in the space of digital agriculture they typically come with people you know having a background in technology and very often they become so passionate and so invested in their technology without really understanding that you know a, a seed an intervention uh, an advisory uh, is probably just one of the many things that a farmer needs to do from pre season planning until harvesting right so we got to understand that product innovations are nested in socio economic and political context i can't underline even this statement enough i think my next line you know i like this line from a chap called yuri levine he said fall in love with the problem and not the solution once you really uh, appreciate and articulate your problem i really will think that you know entrepreneurs will figure out that you know an innovation can only do so much there are so many other things that you really need to understand and incorporate into your design be it your business processes or be into your you know app design or whatever else fifth point inflection points are very real if you remember my very first slide i spoke about you know covid 19 driving a digital transformation right but i think digital world experiences a number of inflection points like you know every 2 years or 3 years there is a new app there is a new technology uh, and uh, you know uh, wireless technologies are changing so i think digital world is experiencing a lot of inflection points the question then back to the agricultural community at large is how do we really you know ride the wave of digital and you know deliver on our crucial uh, agricultural uh, you know agriculture uh, r4d development goals last but not the least uh, it's very important to have a programmatic focus scientific rigor and institutionalization of knowledge in digital agriculture and scaling as well very often i think you know uh, things like digitization of agriculture or scaling are taken up on a pilot basis you know as small innovations in projects i do think it's the time for us to move to a more programmatic focus start treating this as a very real discipline uh, and start probably you know capturing all this knowledge uh, in the form of a case study because i think you know management research happens through case studies right uh, there isn't much of a case study approach that i've seen but i, I do think that the way this uh, sector is evolving time for us to probably start uh, bringing in a more cross disciplinary and a lot of management research as well so those were my uh, few points uh, and that's the end of my presentation thank you daniel oh thanks to you ram i mean very 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 nice print presentation very interesting so so now we move to the section where where we have um the the questions from from the audience from the attendees right so we we have one question from from Judy Howard and she asked like i mean she said first that this, it was very interesting but for you ram like looking yeah. to the future yeah in five years yeah. what oh let me see here what what's your prediction what are the key ways that uh, i have in digitalization will change the way icrisat and the cgi are scientists do they research very nice question no uh, absolutely i think that's a great question um i i do hope uh, you know 
i do hope uh, through through better use and judicious use of digital technologies uh, i think our turnaround time in terms of understanding the demand out there uh, becomes a lot quicker uh, and also i think you know uh, this see i think in food systems changing consumer behavior is also very very essential right so for instance if you want to nudge people to start buying products that are more sustainable that have a favorable impact right so i think digital the potential of digital is multifold uh, it's it's probably not just one individual who can really think of putting digital to a complete maximum use right so that's where we got to think in terms of teams that's where we got to think in terms of ecosystems uh, so that you know it's not just one ram or it's not just one daniel it's it's a community of people who are all adept who are you know who have all the technology pieces that they need who are more driven by problems and then know how to combine different technologies and addressing a certain pain point so my own belief is i think digitalization or i hub or digital within the one cgr context as well i think it will make one cgr more responsive to farmer needs uh, it will make it more responsive to even consumer needs all in all i think one cgr will probably become a lot more agile uh, than what we are today all right great i have a question for didi coming in um, Didi, you mentioned some promising trends, digitalization, increase in, in international healthy diets. How can agriculture, rural development, rural um, agricultural research for development and development organizations together leverage these opportunities? And maybe also thinking about what, what Ram was explaining, no? About the status of digitalization. Yeah, so I, thank you so much. And thanks for your presentation, Ram. Um, I would say that there are a number of ways that we can uh, leverage these opportunities. I think the first one is really sharing knowledge, best practices, and learn lessons learned. And the second is that I think a lot of organizations um, do not come into an environment and say, what is already working and how can we help it scale? You know, there are lots of innovations bubbling up in local communities. And the sad reality is that oftentimes development organizations come in with their own ideology and then they impose those ideologies and they struggle to scale them because they're not homegrown, they're not uh, organic, and they're not viewed with the ownership of the people. And so I think uh, uh, one of the key recommendations I had from my first book, which was on social innovation and scaling, was that in every country, we need to be constantly looking at the local environment, the local solutions, and the ones that already are working and how we can use technology, capitalize on the technology and the knowledge to enable them to scale. Sometimes we see governments and development partners competing with the local players um, instead of collaborating to enable them to scale. I know the US under Obama's presidency actually had an office of social innovation and they were looking at every community saying what is already working, how can we help them scale? So digitization, you know, we, we celebrate MPESA, but how did MPESA um, come about and how, was, how did it scale? They realized that people were actually sending, using uh, airtime as sending airtime to their parents and then their parents actually selling that airtime and, and then using the funds. Mm -hmm. So instead of traveling to give your mother money, you would send your mother airtime. And they mm -hmm. realized airtime was now a tool, right? And that became an opportunity to capitalize on existing needs and use existing telephone infrastructure, agents, networks to actually grow M-Pesa. And today, M-Pesa is used by 70% of adults in East Africa, and it powers energy use, it powers education, it allows people to pay on a daily basis for items. It's totally revolutionized the ecosystem. So for me, that's a big, a big learning and a very important. The same with healthy diets. I mean, our indigenous food is so healthy, and yet we discard it for Western food, right? Because we the, the popular media is that Western food is better. Um, and now we're actually rethinking that whole paradigm and celebrating proudly African food, proudly Nigerian food, and then enabling the knowledge to grow and then scaling that. So I could go on and on with other examples, but really that's the that's the message for me. Very good, thanks. Daniel. Yeah, actually I, I got a question that for, for both for Didi and, and Ram, and, and yeah. it's, it's from Femi, okay? Which is, it's, it, uh, 
It says like talking about the use of data to help your practice of scaling your enterprises. What are the data you look out to collect, acquire? How do you acquire them? And how do you use them more specifically in scaling your works? Yeah, Andy, do you want to go first? Or... I think she's on mute. Okay. I'll I'm go first, first and then I'll, uh, I'll add. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, um, I think the kind of data that you look for when you want to scale depends on the use case. Uh, if you're if you're thinking about you know scaling up a specific variety or a specific crop, then I think you really want to understand a bit more about uh, the typical cropping practices of uh, different farmers. Or uh, uh, see, in a country like India, you know, let me speak a little more uh, about India. A country like India, for instance, uh, we because it's these are very highly intermediated uh, you know supply chains. There is a hard time transmitting the demand data. What is it that the consumers prefer or what kind of traits that consumers are preferring? It's a hard time for us to transmit this information back to farmers as well, right? But again, this is not the only kind of data. I think it changes from use case to use case. Uh, that's kind of the two cents that I have to this question. In our case, we obviously use data for almost everything. Um, when we were starting the Aldean program, we actually had to go and collect data on the dairy communities around these companies and their milking habits and their needs and their desires because we're designing an intervention that was demand-driven but also had to look at the supply chain component. Even with Ace Foods, we don't introduce a new product until we've really looked at the supply chain, the amount of uh, produce, the seasonality, um, the quality, the qu quantity, the pricing, the competitor landscape, and for all the food companies that I'm involved in, and I sit on quite a few boards, we look at data at every board meeting because we're not operating in a vacuum and the environment is very, very dynamic, especially in 2020 with every passing day. And so you're using data to make short-term and long-term decisions. You're also using data to prioritize your investments. Um, and it's consumer data, it's supply chain data, it's distribution data, it's cost data, and it's also um, competitor data. And all of that is very, very, very relevant. Very difficult to get in the African context and uh, a lot of opportunity there. If you have a business model data collection that's relevant and timely. It's it's no different in India and DD. <laughs> data is a challenge, I think, everywhere. All of us are confronted with the same challenge. Yeah, very good question. Very interesting responses also now. Um, Didi, in one of your slides, you, you mentioned it's important to be demand driven, it's involving the customers, and there's a question about this. You talked about uh, AC, ACE and its work in developing and promoting more nutritious, easy to prepare foods from Nigerian ingredients. Can you talk to us about the kinds of outreach AACE does to generate interest and demand for these foods? Yeah, so when we started Ace Foods, we quickly realized it's very expensive to build a strong distribution channel. So mm -hmm. about 90% of our products were B2B, business to business sales. So mm -hmm. we're selling to the likes of Unilever and Flour Mills, a lot of uh, inputs for their own products. Um, now we've started grassroots engagement. We have a program called Our Mama, where we actually empower women uh, with uh, a what is it called? A mama? A mama program where we empower women with small bundles of products and teach them how to become entrepreneurs. So they become our distributors. Um, okay. And that's enabling us to build, you know, a network of uh, distributors across the country. We also have partnered with chains, um, like the equivalents of the shop rights and the games that have, and spa that have operations all over the country. Um, and then we're also leveraging a lot of grassroots uh, marketing, social media marketing influencers, um, and you know, community engagement models, similar to the ones that have been used in India and Bangladesh, uh, partnering with the likes of TechnoServe and other organizations as well. And, and so are it's a multi-pronged competitive in terms of pricing with, with, I mean, imported products from Thailand or something? No, we're definitely more price competitive um, because we are sourcing locally and also okay. because, you know, we want to be affordable and available for the masses of people. Um, and, and during COVID-19 with the restrictions in trade, 
uh, we saw a big, huge demand for our product because okay. obviously it was more difficult to import. And we've recently experienced a major devaluation in our currency. So locally sourced food is more available and more affordable. And that's why I always push for shorter value chain right. and local sourcing as a competitive advantage. Yeah. Okay, good to hear. Great. Daniel? Yeah, I, I, I think we still have like nine minutes left. So what do you think, Leonard? Another question or should we start to wrap up? No, let's do another, let's do another question. It's going very well. We have some good okay. questions coming in. Uh, can you do it, Leonard, please? Okay. Can you ask the question? Uh, so for um, Ram, yeah. um, question uh, on your ingredients. No, you have a list of ingredients. Sure. How can we better learn together about this cross-regional and cross-center issues that are um, that you're basically discussing? No, cross cross CGR, but also cross cross um, cross private sector, cross uh, sure. uh, research, etc. Sure. No, I think uh, that's where I think one CGR I think can be a catalyst. Plus, I think these kind of communities of practice where you're trying to forge these uh, partnerships, I think these are essential. Uh, but per se, I kind of, uh, I, I again refer back to what NDD also mentioned, you know, it's we as research institutions, uh, there's a lot of soft uh, skills also that we can really, you know, I think in Bill Gates in one of the meetings, he spoke about the convening power of CGR institutions, you know, are standing within the local NAR systems are, are standing with the state agriculture universities. Apart from, you know, delivering an improved seed or an improved package of practice, or, you know, apart from the hard science of agriculture, there is a lot of soft science uh, that we have probably embedded within each one of us. Um, and we do, we do exercise a lot of that soft skills uh, in the, in, you know, in, in our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, but probably we don't stop and reflect enough to really, you know, capture all that and make that as, you know, we don't do a proper knowledge management of a lot of the soft stuff that we do. Uh, I think personally, I do believe what we did at Icrisat is a very interesting experiment. We took a, we took an incubator concept, kind of mainstream that into the day-to-day -day functioning of a proper research team. Uh, just because we realize that uh, there is a lot of science in supporting startups as well. There's a lot of science in partnership management as well, right? Uh, I do think that probably we also kind of need to re replicate this kind of an effort at probably at a much broader, at a much more higher level within CGIR and make, it, make public private partnership not like a once in any year effort, you know, don't do like a big data convention is good, but you just meet once you all have a good time and probably you disappear, right? So we probably need to have a slightly different way of doing public private partnership so that it becomes more central to you know your activities rather than it being like a once in a year kind of an activity. It's kind of a slightly uh, abstract answer, but I, I do hope uh, I'm articulating my myself well enough. Yeah, no, great. And Ram, I have a follow-up question because it's actually sure. bothering me a little bit. Sure. You know, <laughs> people say, okay, we reach so many farmers, you know, yeah. and that's great. And then often yeah. the project ends and there appeared not to be enough investment in, yeah. in maintaining that number or even growing that number without the project intervention. Right? And what I see in the big data uh, presentations often is oh, so many downloads, so many downloads, so yeah. many downloads. I, all my apps that I have here, I probably use now 10% of them, no? And I saw that you have like 12 million downloads, yeah. 800,000 active, active users. users. Yeah. How do you bridge, or how do we maybe move away from, okay, so many downloads to, let's focus on the active users and use that as a, as a proxy or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, maybe I'm just going way overboard. No, no, here. no, 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 absolutely. But I think see, uh, ultimately that's what the private investors also look for. You know, they won't be uh, rattled by the numbers of 12 million download. They'll look, they'll know to look at the exact data points, right? Uh, mm. Personally, you're, that's a very important point you touch upon. You know, somebody is just using app does not actually automatically translate into impact, right? It, there's, a, there's a certain gestation period. For instance, take the example of Amazon. I probably would have downloaded Amazon. It would have taken me three or four months before I actually start transacting with it, right? So there is a lot of gestation period uh, that that trust building that's needed on the part of a startup as well. That's why I think, especially in agriculture, as NDD mentioned, I think there is a requirement for a lot of patient capital uh, that's necessary because you got to build that trust. And ultimately, you know, let me also say this. 
uh, i won't evaluate a startup uh, startup's impact or success just by the intervention that it, it delivers if my startup is able to create a sustainable network right if i if i've linked a group of people which never spoke to one another using an app and that network if it is sustaining i think that also is a big win because tomorrow a cgr center wants to roll out a new improved seed can very well leverage that network and basically do 10x of the dissemination vis-a-vis -vis your uh, traditional channels so i think our metrics the way we look at this whole space also has to be different in my personal opinion Yeah, thank you so much, um, Daniel. Over to you. Yeah, yeah. We have three minutes left, so let's let's wrap up this 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 session. Okay. So thank you very much. I mean, first of all, thanks to Ndidi and Ram for such great presentations. Uh, thank you. We've been lucky enough to. Sorry. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've been lucky enough to to listen Didi walking us through uh, how partner how to partner with the private sector to guarantee uh, sustainability of her, of the projects that that she uh, shared with us and how to scale uh, the pilots in a responsible way. I mean, from from Ram, this enable enabling environment of scaling, and in something you know that I can highlight is the role of the CGIR, right? Not only providing the solid science behind the digital tools, but how it, the organization helps to reach much more people, leverage an organization like the CGIR, which has been doing research for development uh, in the tropics for in agriculture for more than 50 years, uh, we got, with an extensive network and experience in the developing world. So, so thank you for 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 uh, for reminding us that 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 the role of the CGIR on this. And from both presentations, I would like to highlight something related to our previous webinar. And it happened that in the, in our previous webinars, we we ha have identified that it's very important to understand the, the big picture of innovation but also to, un to understand the context, building new partnership models with the key partners. And, and, and you both talk about this enabling environment uh, in both presentations, you showed how to line up with, the, with a, wi a wide range of partners, how to make a stronger partnerships, how to get the private sector involved and, and building talent. And, 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 and Ram just mentioned, you know, how to probably work on, on private, public private partnerships uh, in a, uh, to, to do it, but in a different way. So just to, to close the session, I, I thank you all for attending this session. We hope that you have enjoyed this webinar series, series as much as we did. And, and please don't forget that the next year we will elaborate on the topic called in the topic called the extension agent of the future, which was chosen in the last convention of CGR, Big Data Platform for Agriculture, like three weeks ago. And, and actually it plays really well, it plays really well with something that uh, both Didi and, and, and Ram have, have mentioned, and it is not, I mean, it's not so disconnected from scaling because they both, I mean, we were listening to them and, and they, they both mentioned building talent, digitalization of agriculture, youth engagement, tech innovations, climate change, broader vision, nutrition, entrepreneurial spirit, and soft skills. I mean, come on, these apparently sound like the skills, knowledge that the new generation of extension agents should have. So it is not disconnected. It's part of this community or practice. And this is the topic, the topic that we would like to elaborate and move forward the next year. So over to you, Leonard, to, to close it. No, thank you so much. Also, really, thank you to, to Ram and Didi. You, you really have gave us the fireworks at the end of the event. Uh, thank you to, to Daniel and to Maria Camilla for their commitment and interest in the topic of scaling and saying why their initiative basically to say why don't we marry the two communities of practice i think what we're doing in scaling needs to be approached from a network we cannot do it alone we need to come together and uh, getting this kind of exchange between big data people like ram was saying i was a techie before no to so these maybe more uh, fluffy scaling people i think it's really a great uh, a great uh, move and I'm very happy that uh, I want to congratulate Maria Camilla on her new job. So we won't be seeing her back again uh, in this format. And uh, yeah, we keep in touch. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you all for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.